So for more than 10 years now, the European press has documented a reality that stretches beyond, beyond the borders of Europe. And it also shaped its uh, political and news agenda. How do we talk about the refugees ordeal, its political manipulation, especially by the far right, but not only, the cynicism of, of uh, smugglers, the solidarity of volunteers and associations? How do we continue to get European readers interested in a crisis that seems to never end? So the Belarusian reporter Anton Trafimovic and his Greek fellow Stavros Malihoudis will talk to Vox Europe and our readers about the reasons, the stakes and the hurdles behind their fieldwork on one of the major issues of our time. So, Anton Trafimovic, uh, I, I'll start by introducing, introducing you and you can add something if I've missed something out. You are a freelance journalist born in Belarus and now living in Warsaw. Beforehand, you worked for Radio Svoboda, the Bel Bel Belarusian broadcast of Radio Free Europe. And I may not pronounce it properly, but you will correct me, Argumenti Effecti V, v, I don't know how you pronounce it, Belarusi, a Belarusian magazine. You've written an insightful report on the people helping refugees on both sides of the Belarusian Polish border, despite both governments, of course, preventing them to do so, which we published on Vox Europe in December last year. So if you want maybe to say what this, uh, how you pronounce uh, this Belarusian magazine and what it is about, please do now. Oh, uh, well. Uh... Hi everyone. Uh, yeah, um, the only thing is that I was not really born in Belarus. I was born in Eastern Germany, but I was okay. further raised and uh, spent most of my life in Belarus uh, okay, since 1991. That. No, it just a little correction, a uh, little fact from my biography. Not everyone <laughs> knows about. Uh, yeah, I'm. Um, I used to work in this magazine, uh, Argumenti Facte, uh, this is a weekly newspaper in Belarus, uh, like a, um, a local affiliate of the uh, very well known uh, Russian newspaper from the Soviet times, but it was like also many years ago. Uh, for the last six years, I was uh, a reporter with the Radio Free Europe, uh, the Belarusian office, and uh, um, but almost a year as I'm a freelancer and uh, I was staying in Belarus till uh, August and since August I had to uh, uh, to leave uh, first Ukraine and uh, now in Poland, staying here for almost half a year uh, and uh, reporting um, most from uh, the uh, about border issues, but reporting from uh, my apartment. <laughs> uh, this is a very specific situation. Like we um, in Belarus, uh, uh, since 2020, journalists uh, are very much restricted to cover uh, events on the street. Uh, so first it was a pandemia. Yeah. Of 2020, when we had to work from home, and then it was the repressions uh, against mm. uh, society, against journalists and others, that we also had to work from home. So okay. um, yeah, but uh, we learned how to get access uh, on the ground, uh, mm. stay stay at home, and uh, I think it helped a lot and helps now a lot to many journalists who are spread all over uh, the Europe. Uh, so most of my colleagues and friends, they, uh, they live in exile now. Okay, and, uh, I will ask you yeah. some more questions specifically on the way you work uh, before we just present uh, Stavros, and then we will go more specifically mm -hmm. to the, your everyday's work. Thank you yeah. for the positions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So Stavros, uh, you work for Reporters United, which is a kind of collective, uh, investigative uh, collective in Greece, and also Solomon, a digital media outlet specialized on migration. 
and publishing both in Greek and in English, which is very useful. Uh, we've published on Vox Europe a story uh, on the cheap labor behind the business of strawberries red gold in Greece lately. Uh, and you were nominated last year for the prestigious European Press Prize for your collective work on Moria Camp. And you recently discovered that your work on migration prompted the Greek secret services to put you under surveillance, which is something we will discuss uh, a bit later. Um, Stavros, um, just let's go um, to the topic of the, this conversation directly. So the migrants crisis has now been going in Greece for almost a decade. And how, how is the population coping with it after the initial show of solidarity? Is there some kind of, of fatigue? And what about reporting on it? Are news organizations still covering it? And do new angles come out on it? Um, I would say that that's a really interesting uh, question. Uh, I think much of it comes to what you said before that uh, we also need to find some new ways to talk about reporting. And yes, there is some fatigue. Um, I think it's obvious. And I think that in some part it does make sense because people, um, although it, I don't know if it sounds nice or bad, but people are fed up of hearing the same stories. And sadly, this can this can include stories about shipwrecks, or it can include stories about the pushbacks, you know, stories of violation of human rights. So yes, there is a very clear fatigue comparing to, to the previous years. There is reporting, but in Greece we have specific limitations. So in the, in the peak of what we call the refugee crisis, it was interesting that most of the big and the important stories that would come from foreign outlets, so it would be Greeks who would work for foreign outlets like uh, European or international outlets. And these whole stories would be published there because these were the media that could pay uh, you know, freelancers and these were the media that could have a reporter work on a story for weeks. So it's, it, I, think, I think it's an interesting paradox that most of the important stories, they do pub get published in uh, international media. Um, and then there are um, outlets like us, like what you described, the uh, Solomon and Reporters United. There are great colleagues. There are, I think they have really good journalists in Greece who work on the ground. There are some limitations when it comes to access, especially with uh, the current government. But I think that um, more or less there is good coverage of the issue. The, 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 the major challenge is how to better say these stories and how to, you know, to, to, to give the message and the content and all the info that we collect on the ground in a more uh, engaging way that is also uh, appealing to the audience. Um, I think that's the main challenge. But th there are um, there are great reporters on the ground who do report with within great limitations. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Stavros. Uh, I get back to you, Anton. You were explaining how you left Paris and, and leaving Polo, that now reporting from home. Uh, I was wondering two things. I mean, how did you, how, I mean, were, were there a reporting, some reporting, any reporting on migration before the border crisis with Poland? And how do you concretely do nowadays uh, to write about the solidarity with migrants at the border, uh, especially if you're stranded at home? And, um, uh, and how do you how do you concretely gather in or gathered and today gather information uh, about the situation alongside um, the, the country's border? How do you approach refugees, helpers, villagers? Do they contact you as well uh, uh, spontaneously? Spontaneously, and are they wi willing and and to talk openly despite all the risk involved, of course, which you mentioned. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, I'll start from the first about the uh, migration crisis. Uh, Belarus was never uh, on the crossroads uh, of the uh, of those huge flows of migrants uh, because this is a northern country and uh, we border uh, on Ukraine, on Russia, and pre-EU countries. So um, 
there were some uh, several thousands Chechen refugees uh, trying to get to Poland uh, through Belarus. It was like 2016, 17, but uh, uh, the um, the scale was never like that, and uh, never in the international media never had um, interest in covering uh, migrants' problems because they're was not that many uh, as it's now and the the difference is that uh, uh, the current my, uh, my, uh, migrant crisis it's, it's artificial it was created by the government they don't hide it they uh, they really admitted that they uh, it was created by them so um, um Actually, this is for the first time you see the footage from Belarus, which reminds you uh, of uh, the footage from uh, Greek, uh, from Greece, or from uh, Serbia back into uh, 2015. Uh, but uh, you would never expect it. Uh, so everyone was uh, so surprised to see so many people coming from uh, mostly Iraq uh, to Belarus uh, and this is not something normal and now when right after the government decided to stop the crisis uh, all migrants disappear from the streets uh, uh, so and uh, you were asking about uh, uh, how to oh the uh, the how, how to cover this yeah the concrete so, way of, of working especially if you stuck at home uh, yeah uh, even uh, the thing is even if I were in Minsk I would stay still at home because uh, there is a risk of being detained uh, mm. only the journalists from the state-owned media w were allowed to go to the border and actually uh, record those interviews talk to migrants and also uh, foreign uh, journalists that uh, who has no Belarusian passports so if it was a foreigner from like United States or United Kingdom he could get access and uh, be signed but not Belarusian journalists uh, so I would still stay at home. So uh, what I had to do, what I have, still have to do, uh, I've been covering the, this topic since summer when it started. Like in August, I had a chance to get a, uh, a phone of the migrants who actually stuck on the border. So I just called them. Uh, they were staying at the border with Latvia for like two weeks. And uh, for several days, I was very lucky to get in touch with them. But it was very long chain of uh, finding them. So uh, I asked a friend of mine who traveled to Iraq, and then he redirected me to his friend from Hungary. And like all this chain brought me uh, to the border uh, and the migrants who were uh, willing to talk to journalists. Uh, this time, uh, uh, like uh, I still have lots of friends who uh, live in, in Minsk, so um, I asked some of them just to go to the um, bus station where there were hundreds of migrants every day and just to talk to them on the phone. Uh, and the, um, also there are there were thousands of migrants at the border, but it was hard to reach to them. The easiest way for my colleagues was to talk to them via TikTok, because somehow mm -hmm. TikTok became the most popular uh, um, social media those migrants had. Uh, and uh, most of the unique footage was downloaded by journalists from TikTok and also Telegram channels created by the migrants. Mm -hmm. So I had to translate to Kurdish to search on the telegram, ask for permissions to get into those groups, and uh, actually talked to several people. They were willing, they they had uh, their relatives on the border, but um, they refused to be quoted. So they wanted to, uh, for me, only uh, to help to their uh, relatives. So they, uh, um, for them, like a journalist, especially writing for foreign media, was a chance to uh, somehow get those migrants to Poland or to, to Germany. But uh, just for the story, it was really hard. And uh, then again, through a long chain of contacts and friends uh, 
through Iraqi journalists and Iraqi locals. Yeah, I mm-hmm. got a chance to talk via email. So it was like okay. through a person emailing mm-hmm. and talking to uh, to the migrants who actually ended up in, uh, in Germany. Uh, but um, many people uh, many, many people they refuse to uh, share their names there's after this experience in harsh experience in belarus and poland especially uh, they do they just uh, say it was the worst experience in their life what they uh, lived through uh, when uh, going through this border but of course there are always uh, people who are willing to have them like both in Poland and Belarus, uh, they risk, in Belarus it's actually risking their life to help migrants, because uh, you're not way, allowed. Uh, when you say mm-hmm. risking their lives, what do you mean? Um, because uh, at the moment, the gov- oh, uh, back in uh, fall time, the government was using migrants in their matters for their purposes uh, to, uh, so only state journalists were allowed to talk to them and only um, uh, politicians, like pro Lukashenko's politicians uh, Mm -hmm. could like publicly help them. But it was like, when it was real help, a real offering uh, or uh, uh, humanitarian aid, uh, you would be in great risk to do it publicly. So uh, I found uh, volunteers, like just a group of friends, they gathered on Facebook and uh, they were secretly searching for migrants and secretly bringing them food, money, uh, trying to help with documents because if the government found out what they were doing, uh, at least they could go to, to prison because uh, it's just this uh, like no one is allowed to help mm. what the government should uh, is aiming to do if, if it's clear if, if, i don't know yeah thanks thanks a lot yeah. uh, just a question came to my mind while you were talking uh, anton uh, while reporting in such a let's call it remote way uh, how do you make sure that you're speaking to genuine uh, people I mean, not people pretending to be uh, refugees or whatever. Um, How can you trust them? Yeah, uh, this is a good question uh, of, uh, yeah, the the question of uh, of trust. Um, Like, um, I try, well, somehow to, as is possible, to verify uh, if I'm, even talking through someone that uh, it is uh, a refugee actually who is claiming uh, uh, what he's claiming to, who is claiming to be uh, um, like when when in Minsk uh, yeah I know uh, like volunteers I reached to and who shared the context of the people they were helping so uh, yeah I just trust those people because uh, while talking to them they i mean they sound trustworthy and uh, i don't see any um, uh, um like hidden agenda why they sh- would uh, claim anything uh, and uh, again when approaching those guys uh, uh, in germany like by by the end, uh, like by the the, the last uh, uh, person I I talked to, yeah, I uh, I was like mostly sure. Yeah, of course, there is. I think could be a chance uh, because uh, you cannot ask for documents to be shown, uh, mm-hmm. something like that. But uh, I don't see any other possibility. Uh, like to like triple check the uh, authenticity uh, of this. Even uh, when I was talking on the phone, like people were telling, okay, with their name and where they're from, but how could you actually check it? Uh, well, because they they also uh, pro- most likely. Uh, want to share very specific information about them. So uh, this is why you need like a 
uh, num like several different voices. So it it um, uh, for um, for the story to be trustworthy. Yes, thank you, Anton. Uh, Stavros, uh, you're more you're lucky enough to uh, be able to operate on the field, uh, really. So, how do you concretely gather information on asylum seekers, and do they talk to you easily and openly when when you're really facing them? And is there any specificities of reporting on asylum seekers' situation because they are particularly uh, delicate? Uh, sometimes they, they, they can't share their names or they, they don't want the, the pictures to be taken. Um, same goes for your sources, I guess, so also for uh, the safety of their families. So how, how do you operate? Yeah, in, in big part, um, things used to be a bit easier during the past years um, when it comes to the camps, to the refugee camps. So the previous camps used to be those um overcrowded facilities that they would actually extend outside the initial structure so there even if you even if it, you didn't have permission officially to go there and you know report uh, interview people you could still sneak in and um, talk with people um this has changed when it comes to the camps in the mainland and on the islands now we have those new structures which are you know, some people call them uh, prison. Um, so there are big walls and there's surveillance and cameras and everything. So you cannot go there um, as you could. Um, but but uh, big populations of the people on the move, they are in the cities like in, in Athens or Thessaloniki, Patras, where they try to go to Italy from. So they are reporting still is, you know, quite feasible. There are specific areas. There are people that we know. Um, and I think one thing that we have, um, let's say, achieved at Solomon is that we we know the communities. We don't, you know, we don't just report about them and we don't remember them, you know, twice per year to, to just write a story. We we know the communities. We you know we live with them. We have friends, uh, members of Solomon are refugees themselves, and I think this kind of trust is something that uh, cannot compare to to anything. So. There is one aspect that is that when we need to or when we want to work on a story, we can, can direct our you know, request to the communities. But there is also the best um, condition, in my view, the best relationship, which is that uh, the communities themselves, they come to us when they have a story or when they have heard something or when they want to share some information. Um, and I think this is, this is the, you know, the best level of trust that you can get. And then, of course, there are also people on the ground, like Anton uh, mentioned, like uh, volunteers, NGO workers, people in the international organizations who operate here. Um, and I think that the people on the ground who care about an issue and they, they, they follow it and they work on it, when they see that you really care about something, that you, that you cover it because you, know, you really want to do it, you don't have any interest specific or some secret uh, reason, then they will trust you and then they will, you know, they will aid you in your reporting. So I would say that it's a combination like of, of, of these aspects. Okay, Th thanks a lot, uh, Stavros. Uh, Anton, again, a, a question on, on uh, Belarus. Um, how is the, the press covering the, this crisis at the moment? And uh, how are people getting re reliable news on it? Uh, and also on what happens, generally speaking, in Western Europe. That's a question about the press and the what's left of an independent press and how do people get mm -hmm. news? Yeah, uh, uh, as I already mentioned a little bit, um, it's really hard for independent journalists to get uh, there uh, to get to actually to the border and uh, to the camp, which is created on the border with Poland uh, since last November, I think, uh, after this huge attack uh, on the Polish border guards. Um, and uh, uh, now the, uh, I would say the, the topic uh, of uh, migrants uh, almost gone 
from uh, from Belarusian media, uh, both independent and state media. I think there are uh, around 500 um, uh, refugees uh, or, or migrants staying uh, at the uh, at the camp at the border, and. Um, um, I think just uh, um, several times a week you can uh, see something, uh, some news uh, uh, about them. So uh, what the um, mm -hmm. uh, there are still attempts of uh, uh, getting through the border uh, by migrants, uh, and it's been reported, but it. Uh, even uh, for instance, if in uh, last November it was like around uh, 500 or well, almost uh, 800 uh, people were trying to attack the border daily, now it's like several dozens. So um, it's not uh, that. Uh, serious uh, at the moment and uh, what the government does they are probably just uh, sending people back here to uh, or where they're from like to Syria, Iraq and uh, um, other countries. Um, the uh, the thing or why is this topic is not a uh, um, is not well covered. I would say it's not well covered in Belarus by Belarus and like both independent and state media because uh, we've got lots of other uh, harsh events. There are repressions against uh, civil society. Are um, they not? They don't stop. There are journalists all, uh, almost every week. New journalists are detained or arrested, and uh, and you. Uh, no, referendum is about to happen uh, mm -hmm. in February, so there are a lot of political activity, lots of uh, police activity. Still, people have to uh, flee uh, and go to Ukraine, Poland, and other countries. Uh, and when the scale of uh, the uh, these um, attempts be became like not that. Uh, visible as it used to be, uh, media just uh, stop paying attention to it. I think, unfortunately, uh, like the media uh, also don't have enough uh, hands uh, to cover everything, so uh, it just became not uh, the uh, the priority uh, of this topic uh, just dropped. Mm. Okay, thanks. Um, there's a Question by Emanuele, uh, which is quite interesting for actually both of you, Anton and Stavros. So it's how, how do you find the balance between doing a journalistic work and helping migrants in need uh, that reach you and your colleague? And what is the role of journalists in, situ in this kind of situation? And I would add also, uh, how can you keep a distance with uh, the topic uh, you are uh, you are covering when it's uh, such a sensitive and also sometimes uh, moving and uh, uh, full of stakes uh, topic is is there a, a boundary between the the journalist and its ethics and uh, uh, the other ethics that would impose you to uh, would have you to help people who are in need uh, whatever your profession is I don't know who, who wants to talk first, maybe Stavros? Um... Sure, uh, that, that's a super interesting question and I think that uh, it's also a debate, like there's no final answer. Uh, and I think that if we, we are 26 people here, if we talk about it, everybody will have their own view. Um, in, in my opinion, I mean, this, this does come a lot and I guess for Anton also, it's like, and it's also logic because when you report about people, you know, they are people and de facto when it comes to reporting on migration in Greece, it's usually people who are in, in a less privileged position than you are uh, as a reporter. Uh, we, we have come very often into this issue and like, or maybe you will, you know, you will report uh, about someone's story and then maybe he will be in need, maybe he will, you know, need money or maybe he would need anything. Um, on this, on this issue, usually we get advice from uh, more experienced journalists. My view is that you cannot pay someone for their uh, 
story for, for the information they provide or for anything. You cannot do that because that means that even if you don't feel like that, you kind of buy this story. And this also, you also uh, make the person, uh, uh, you know, uh, you, you are more dominant against this person. And uh, so what we have come across a lot and what we do is that because at Solomon, we also, uh, we provide media trainings for refugees and uh, our thought on this is that sometimes we when we prefer to um, to have a more personal relationship with these people uh, we will not report on their stories anymore so i think that's uh, i think that's fair so for example we had the issue with um, a guy who's now a friend islamuddin and when we realized that he was in need and we wanted to help him we said that, you know, okay, this relationship now will be in this way. We will help him and he will be our friend, but we are not going to, to write this story. Um, as I said, I think this is uh, keeping the balances and the, the distances and everything. It's a very, um, you know, it's, it's a discussion. It's not something that you can be, you know, 100% sure about it. But in general, I think you can help people. You can, you know, uh, help with a, with something they need. You can in the detention camps, for example, you can you know help them with you know buying them uh, mobile time or you know a card or things they need, but you cannot uh, like pay them. Um, this is it. I mean, it's as I said, it's a discussion. Thank you. Anton? Yeah, yeah, same yeah. for me. Uh, this is a very, very complicated question. And every time you talk to someone who is like actually freezing in the forest and uh, uh, like uh, one step from dying, uh, and uh, you are, you, you can do like as a person, as a human being, uh, like I really want to help those people but uh, i understand that um, just my work covering these topics is also very very important and uh, it might help like both these people who are in need and uh, prevent other migrants to get in those situations and or uh, uh, decision makers uh, they they can also somehow react after those stories so uh, nothing bad is happening to those people uh, but uh, and to, uh, since I'm kind of distanced at, at this moment when covering uh, this crisis, migrant crisis, I'm in the position when I can't like directly help those people. But uh, I know uh, several uh, when I was actually uh, reporting for Vox Borders, uh, Vox Europe, um, uh, I got contacts of the volunteers from journalists who was also both covering first, but then she switched to volunteering. She was actually helping to those migrants in Minsk, especially with the uh, big families who had no money. Uh, and uh, uh, she wrote a lot about it on Facebook and uh, she experienced lots of hate speech like, First, it was like anti-migrant, and then it was uh, like, you're a journalist, you, don't, you must not uh, help people, you must just report and take pictures. But uh, uh, when she, as I understand, when she started helping, she stopped uh, reporting. So uh, the same as uh, Star Wars said. And uh, I remember once uh, in my, uh, uh, my journalist background when I was covering this Chechen uh, crisis, uh, also on the border of Belarus and Poland. Uh, we were coming, me and, Ed, and the photographer were coming to the same family for several times. And uh, um, we already like kind of made friends with them. So the another time when we uh, visited them, we just brought some uh, treatments for their kids. So we bought even a, a bike because they didn't have like a football, uh, but uh, we didn't uh, see it as a, you know, kind of corruption pain for the story because the, those people were already sharing their stories and they, they never asked for this help. 
So I think it's very, it depends on the on the situation and uh, every time it's really hard decision. Um, but uh, well, I prefer to stick to the profession and uh, to help one with the uh, coverage, uh, which is also, I think, helps a lot. Thanks a lot, uh, Anton. Um, I have a question for you, uh, Stavros. Uh, in November 2021, last November, a story came out that you were under surveillance by the Greek secret services, most probably for the work that you and Solomon are doing to cover the refugee crisis. Did it come as a shock to you or were you not surprised? What would the Greek government decide? Why would the Greek government decide to spy on a journalist for such work? And what, are, what were the consequences for you? Do you get support by, from the Greek and the European journalistic community in this situation? Yeah, um, first of all, I would say that, uh, and also my colleague Liliana is here, so she can confirm. Uh, we used to have this joke a lot that they are, you know, I don't know, listening to the phone, or we would have this joke that, you know, like when we talked in the morning, we would say, like, say hello to the boys. Uh, that's a quite widespread joke in Greece. Um, so I mean that there is some feeling of people that they are being heard at least on the phone. Uh, so, but it, it was still surprising. So, although we would joke a lot about it, it, it still is surprising, you know, to wake up on, I don't know, a Saturday morning and see a front page that then reveals that, among other people, uh, you were being surveilled. Um, it, uh, as it matters, the, when it comes to the consequences, the first thing, uh, to be very honest, since we are here, is that in the beginning, I think we felt a kind of cool, like, oh, okay, nice. Uh, that means we are doing something. But to be honest, then, then it really becomes overwhelming because you, you know, you wonder, like, it's the questions that you posed, like, why would they be interested on this? And um, you don't know why this surveillance uh, is going on, when it began in what context, in what grounds, for what reason, has it stopped now, has it not stopped? We know for sure that it had to do with my mobile, which was being uh, heard from the secret uh, agency. Um, so that you come across many questions which have to do with uh, issues that you are not very comfortable with. And um, also the state agency, um, I have to say that they don't. it doesn't have the best reputation in Greece. And there are many reports and there are many, you know, um, so this, this, these all are very worrying. Uh, even more worrying is the fact that as we are talking now, lots of our work has to do with people who um, are vulnerable and people who maybe don't have documents or people who maybe um, work at an, uh, you know, I don't know, a big organization and they talk to us, although they probably shouldn't. Um, so this 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 also seems very uh, intrusive also for, for these people, you know, I mean, it doesn't have only to do with myself and how I feel about them hearing my my phone calls, but it has to do also with, you know, all, all this aspect uh, of the people who talk to us. The, but at least uh, for, the, for your second question, we had really big support from the journalistic community and from the uh, journalist unions and from the media watchdogs, um, from the European, you know, all the European uh, unions and the IPI, uh, there was really big support. And I think for this thing, at least we are, uh, you know, we are grateful. Um, what one last point is that uh, what I think is that it was revealed that they spy on me. So this means that they spy on many more people and probably many more journalists, because as you understand, it's, uh, you know, I'm not like the, the most important journalist in Greece or the biggest or, you know, the, the, the most uh, dangerous to the state or whatever. Uh, and uh, so we are sure that this happens to other journalists at all. And it's very worrying that you, we cannot get answers because there was a, um, a law passed uh, in the past year that changed one aspect. Uh, I mean, I will not go into details, but 
before someone like me would have the right when the surveillance is over to maybe get informed about from a, an independent authority and be informed that you know Stavro at this point you were surveilled for this reason uh, there was a new law that passed in uh, in the past year that changed this right so people now they don't have the right anymore to get informed that they were under surveillance at any point um, and I think this also this only stands in Hungary and Bulgaria and uh, Russia this new legislation yeah. Uh, thanks, uh, Stavros. It reminds me to uh, the 70s in Italy. Well, I was a kid at that time, but it was journalists who were working at that time in Italy who always paid jokes on uh, the Carabinieri being listening to them uh, because those were the times in which the, this, let's say, the secret services and the police were uh, really spying on, uh, on journalists. Um, Anton, maybe what. Um, uh, what Stavros has been saying rings a bell to you or sounds familiar to you. Uh, we know that Belarus is not on top of the list uh, in Europe and when it comes to uh, freedom of the press. So uh, how is uh, the, the situation today with regards to uh, freedom of the press and, um, and journalists? You, you talk about journalists being arrested regularly and in jail. Uh, do you know how many are there in jail currently? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, well, there is uh, almost no journalism and almost no freedom in Belarus at the moment. Uh, it's very sad to say, but uh, it's almost true. I think it's like very close to truth. Uh, uh, among my observations was uh, that it's like recently we have a chat with journalists from Belarus. Uh, it was created like in 2020, and uh, it was uh, it, uh, we had a poll uh, last week, uh, like whether people are still working in Belarus or abroad, and uh, uh, around 60% of those journalists uh, are now uh, live abroad because they are uh, either persecuted or uh, don't feel safe or they just cannot work normally uh, and officially in Belarus. Uh, so um, the situation, I don't know if any other country has a situation like that when most of the media had to uh, move whole newsrooms abroad and broadcast from abroad uh, you know, when the targeted audience is still in Belarus, like is still in the country. So it's like now, like the country is, is here and the journalists are all over around uh, actually covering about the events happening in the country and about the country. Uh, so this is a new reality. I, I, I'm not sure if it's gonna end anytime soon. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm. Uh, I just found. Uh, did I uh, answer your question? I just found an interesting question uh, from the chat uh, from Domeni Dominica about the reaction of people living near migrant camps. Uh, if I can quickly respond, uh, there, this is super interesting situation when people living in Belarus near the camp. They actually wanted to help those migrants because officially state TV says, oh, well, poor migrants, they have uh, nothing to, uh, uh, they have nothing to eat, they have no place to uh, live. So the people were actually coming to the uh, like locals to to the uh, to this camp and asking, "Hi, hey, can we bring? Can you kind of take some people? Like I don't have enough space, but at least it's warm. Uh, it's like winter, so I have some food." And they were rejected. The border guards said, "Just go away uh, because they don't want people to help. They just." use them and uh, do whatever they uh, like i would say it was like um, they were treating them like slaves doing using them on um, in, in the way they they, they needed like politically okay stavros um from your experience what's the reaction of people living near migrant camps um, I would say that it depends. Uh, what is maybe interesting is that 
now after all these years that you know some migrant camps operate for five years six years um they are i would say that they are quite embedded in the in the life of the rest community and what's maybe maybe interesting is that in many cases there are people who are in the camps and they are uh, they work in the area i wouldn't say that they go work in the with the best uh, conditions i would say that you know they're usually exploited but it's uh, interesting to see that for example some some needs of the area are now are now filled by people uh, by refugees um and then we have two sides which are very po very polarized in Greece. So we have the one side, which is what Anton described also, which is the, the side of the people of solidarity who want to help and who want uh, to live with the refugees and who want the refugee children to go to school. And then we have the other side, which is very, uh, I think it's smaller, but it's very loud and then it makes a lot of noise. And especially in North Greece and in some part, in the previous years on the islands, which makes some sense because they were the you know the the areas where people would arrive to. Uh, so there we have the people who don't want the refugees and they don't want even Greek uh, refugee children to go to school. And we have had like attacks on the children or attacks on the buses who drive the children to school or attack to the parents or attack to the houses with breaking the glasses and you know throwing stones. Um, so there there have been many incidents that. Uh, people didn't allow a bus to arrive on a place where it would, you know, bring, I don't know, 40 refugees to a hotel or to to, to a place. Um, I think that this, por this, this portion of people is much smaller, but as I said, they are very loud. And they are also, I, that's, a, that's a discussion for another panel that would take, I don't know, 10 hours, but they are very much also fueled by the rhetoric of the current government who before coming into power, they had a very hostile and very um, aggressive uh, rhetoric and discourse about refugees. And now that this, you know, this kind of discourse has in part also these effects, now they are blaming the people, you know, that they are far right. Um, so I would say that it, like everything in the Greek society is very polarized. It's people who want to help and people who want refugees out of the country. Um, for the moment, I think that uh, people who want to help, they they do quite better. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's one question uh, by the e Events Foundation, which I will read to you. Thank you for your work and insights. What do you think is still missing in covering migration to Europe by independent media? Are you concerned that the situation in Ukraine will absorb media attention? and leave the migrant crisis at the border unnoticed? So it, you could both answer, maybe Anton first and... Yeah, uh, I, I have my opinion and, uh, and my observation about uh, this whole situation. Uh, so I think, uh, so as I see, the situation in Ukraine at the moment is like just the next stage of the migrants crisis in Belarus uh, because uh, what Lukashenko does he tries to attract as much attention of the world as possible and uh, wants to take the role of uh, uh, at least regional leader uh, who is very uh, important you know, for the world. So, and uh, since the, uh, the crisis uh, with migrants uh, ended up with no results for him, uh, so uh, I think it, it looks to me like the, uh, the whole situation with uh, Ukraine is uh, again artificially uh, created and forced by by Lukashenko. It was uh, just a matter of uh, you know, military training, and now it looks kind of uh, the beginning of the war, which is unbelieved not. Uh, so uh, yeah, the and unfortunately the um, the fact that the micro uh, the the migrant crisis is. Uh, 
the, the is fading. Uh, yeah, this is true. And uh, I don't know, uh, at least from the Belarusian uh, Polish side, how to uh, bring it back. Unfortunately, uh, only like those bad news that are provoking huge attention to to the problem. When uh, it's already not a not that huge, uh, it's really hard to uh to push uh both uh, the public opinion and the media uh, uh so i don't know uh, someone uh, uh, stavros he had more experience of uh, working uh, on on this topic uh, maybe he can uh, add more mm. do you want to add something uh, stavros um i would like to add on the first question on you know what's missing in mm. uh, in the coverage today. Uh, I think overall that we do have great reporting in the continent and uh, on migration and there is uh, important work being done. I think that one thing that could be done more is um, collaborations across countries, cross-border uh, researches, cross-border investigations, cross-border stories, because uh, these issues are all, you know, pan-European and uh, what happens in Greece for example, or in Italy or in Spain or, I don't know, in, in Belgium, is not only Greek or Spanish or Italian or, or Belgian. And all these stories, they connect when it comes to conditions, when it comes to the money, when it comes to the stories of the people, they are so interconnected among different countries. So I think uh, one thing that could be done more is collaborations. And the second thing that has to do more with the independent reporting is that we could also try to portray, I don't know, better all those uh, complex realities, because one sense that I have is that very often we have the media on the left who uh, portray refugees just, you know, as victims. And I mean, with only this kind of uh, identity, like poor, uh, victims like not not giving the, giving them their uh, agency uh, and then you have on the right the media who portray them as I, I don't know villains and suspicious and you know having some some intentions that they hide so I think we, we have to to try to better portray all the complex identities that every person has and all the people have and all the and also talk about you know things that I don't know about stereotypes and about uh, all these sides that uh, we really need to do it. You know, like to that will help also a better understanding of uh, of other people. Um, so I think I think that would be a second aspect. Yeah, thanks, Stavros. What you what you said earlier on uh, on cross border collaboration is like we say in Italy, honey to my ears. Because this is uh, precisely what we try to do uh, yeah. um, at Vox Europe along with our partners. Um, and what you also mentioned uh, brings me to maybe our maybe our la last questions, if not the, the almost the last question. Um, as you said, the more we talk about the refugee crisis, the more uh, anti-migrant narratives seems to develop uh, within the European public opinion. Um, and do you think and this is a question to both uh, of you that uh, at times uh, that it would be better not to cover it and to keep it rather under the radar or how, how can we find a, a balance uh, between reporting what has to be reported and not triggering this kind of reaction in the in the public opinion Who wants to go first maybe anton so we alternate uh, you, you know, uh, uh, like this anti-migrant anti uh, speech and opinion uh, has unexpectedly became also very relevant to Belarus. Uh, the, uh, the, the interesting fact is that uh, we all in Belarus, it is called we all, all uh, are taught that uh, Belarusians is very moderate and tolerant uh, people. And then uh, that, you know, like through uh, centuries, we've been living in a multicultural uh, country. Uh, like the there were uh, Tatars, Jews, uh, Russians, Belarusians, Poles in every town, and they were uh, living uh, uh, 
uh, peacefully. And then we see several thousand migrants in the country and uh, so many debates on uh, why should we help them? We have our, our own problems. Uh, let them uh, uh, solve their problems themselves. Uh, it's Lukashenko's fault. It's not Belarusians. So, uh, and I, me personally, I was so like uh, surprised to see this hate speech from uh, from the people which uh, consider that themselves tolerant. Uh, and uh, uh, I think this is a matter uh, of education and uh, basic culture, uh, how to, um, uh, there is no need uh, to stop uh, reporting, but there is a need to educate people uh, in like starting from, from school, from kindergarten. Uh, about uh, diversity because there is no way like uh, Europe uh, will become uh, a mono-ethnic uh, continent uh, anymore. So this is a reality and I think we it's hard to uh, turn conservatives to, uh, to, um, to accept uh, a new uh, moral, but uh, what we can do is only like to work with uh, the students, I think, to work for the future. Yeah. Thank you. Stop and uh, yeah, I totally agree with Anton and he covered me in a big part. I think we, we, we don't, we shouldn't stop, I don't know, reporting on, uh, on this, but we can find our ways to, to do it better. And for example, one thing has to do with uh, the wording and the discourse and the, the vocabulary that we use. Um, for example, we in Greece, we may very often use the word which uh, in English translates to influx. And uh, this, I don't know, somehow makes people think like, I don't know, it's some water or whatever coming from Turkey to Greece. Uh, or we, we we all talk about you know refugee crisis, but for example in Greece we had a few tens of uh, thousands of uh, refugees who came last year, and this was a problem. But we aim to have I don't know 30 million tourists coming every year, and some of them you know come from the Balkans, which is also an influx. Like if you make it uh, visually, uh, but this is not the problem. This is a target. So I think we we can re reoccupy, I don't know, a, a vocabulary that will also help. Um, in Greece, we have very much the debate, uh, the far right, they call the people illegal migrants, uh, or the, this government, they used to call the people economic migrants. But then if you look at the data from the asylum service, like a big majority of the people, they actually have a refugee background. I mean, all, all people should have, you know, the right to, to move. Uh, but even this thing that immediately somehow they change the narrative and the discourse and the people who do have a refugee background, they are presented as economic migrants who simply came here to work, like I would go to work in Italy. Uh, this, you know, we have to be more, uh, uh, we have to re reoccupy the, the wording. Um, and we, I think we need to cover all these issues more honestly. And I think this, this will help. We, we don't, we cannot avoid reporting, but we can offer a more honest and more uh, responsible reporting. Uh, 